Welcome to the Startup Grind. Tim has uh, done, spent his career in the financial area. He currently is the CEO of Chargeback.com, uh, a pretty awesome startup that helps you uh, recoup costs from chargebacks. And uh, so without further ado, I'm going to welcome Tim Cottrell to the stage. Guys, give it up for him. <laughs> I don't know why it's not like that when I walk in the office. On morning, but it's not. Yeah, and you even pay them. <laughs> well, now we know what we can do. These guys are from the company, oh, so there you go. I want to thank them for coming. Big expectations. Uh, now there's new, a new standard, I think. So glad to be here. So getting started, we want to hear about your background and uh, you know, what kind of put you on track to enter the financial area. OK. Um, you know, I, I didn't start out as an entrepreneur. I started working in financial services companies. Mm -hmm. um, when I came out of graduate or undergraduate, my undergraduate degree was in social ecology, and I realized that the jobs I could I could get into with that is insurance salesman, school teacher, or social worker, and none of those sounded appealing to me. So I went back to business school, and um, I ended up working for Citibank. Um, out of graduate school, and I started uh, in an operations manager's role uh, managing a group of collectors. So I kind of got exposed to risk management, operations management, and financial services uh, straight out of graduate school. Um, you know, it was an experience to, uh, to start leading a team of 25 people with no prior leadership experience. Uh, so I learned by fire. Wow. And since then, you know, I, I worked my way through a variety of larger companies and then uh -huh. started on the startup path um, in probably 1996. Way cool. So uh, that's an interesting major. Uh, I'm, I actually this is the first time I've heard of it. And so th tell me about uh, ha has your schooling really prepared you for your experiences in the rural world? Yeah, I, I would say it has. I mean, that particular degree is, is never heard of by anyone because it only exists at that one school. Okay. And, uh, but it takes into consideration human behavior, environmental analysis, and criminal justice. Okay. So it kind of teaches you to look at the world holistically and think about human behavior as kind of a system. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that apply very well in my business world because that's what you're doing is you're operating a large business system. Yeah. So I, I think it, it has helped. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the business skills got me oriented um, around the functional things that are important to running a company, you yeah. know, accounting and finance and um, you know, computer science and things like that. So, um, having, I mean, you were, I'm going to take a wild guess and say you were born before the internet, and uh, how had how could you, you tell? <laughs> well, I, I wasn't, but uh, how have you seen, you know, the, the internet and specifically technology play a role throughout your career, and how have you had to adjust to that? Yeah, so, you know, the internet didn't, didn't really exist um, at the time I started my business career, right around that time. Okay. Um, so, I, um, but technology was always important in every role that I, I had in the uh -huh. company. It was different technologies, but we were applying it in similar ways. Okay. Trying to make business functions more effective, trying to make the user experience better. Okay. Um, so a lot of my work uh, is in credit card operations, and in the operations center, you have a lot of interaction with customers. But you're looking at the screen, and they're talking to you on the phone. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty analogous to that. We're building systems in the back office to allow that customer service rep to efficiently talk to a person um, over the phone. Yep. With the internet, we're interacting directly with the, the uh, consumer uh, on the internet. Um, so it's very similar. A lot of the skills that um, I think applied in those prior jobs have helped in the uh, startup world as well. Um, so when you were trying to, to decide whether or not you wanted to risk you know, your, your livelihood and do the startup, what was your thought process and what were your like, biggest considerations? Yeah, I, I think that, um, I've, and I'll kind of summarize it um, to the conclusion that I've come to, is that there's really, to me, there's not that much more risk in starting a company or being a part of a startup mm -hmm. than there is in working a big company. But you get control over the outcome a lot more in a startup world. Okay. You know, it works for some big companies like Citibank, and I had nothing to do with the decision making about how that company company ran. I okay. only had to do with what we did day to day, and beyond that, it was completely out of my control. Uh -huh. So if they decided that they wanted to close down a region, it's just the way it was. My job goes away. 
Right. But at least in a startup, I can see that the decisions I make have an impact on my, my uh, livelihood. Mm -hmm. um, so I've come to a conclusion there's no more risk in a startup than in a big company. It might oh, feel yeah. that way a little bit. Yeah, no, it definitely you get a, feels that way. Yeah, you get this big, beautiful building, you know, and all these amenities. Uh -huh. um, but really, when you're in a startup, it comes down to what you do. And if you make it successful, you're creating your own job security. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, then um, with your family, were, was there hesitation, you know, from that side of your... Uh, not really. I, um, you know, at the time I was married and um, she was very supportive. Sure. Um, you know, at that time I was sort of, I'd left GE and I was looking at the startup in San Francisco versus a job in New York with uh -huh. American Express. And she was really left it to me. She said, follow your heart. And it really was, really I want to cool. build something. And I think I can. So, um, you know, I said no to New York City and um, mm -hmm. yes to San Francisco. And we built a pretty good sized company out of that. Okay. And now how did you end up coming to the other valley here in Utah. Yeah, so um, a really strange story. I, I, um, I'm an actual investor in a small VC fund called Subtraction Capital. One uh -huh. of the guys from Subtraction is here, with Paul Willing. Awesome. And um, I, I was ready to go back into a CEO role, CEO role this year anyway. Uh -huh. And um, I decided to uh, make this investment in the portfolio. And one of the portfolio companies was chargeback.com. Okay. And I thought, while I'm out skiing, I'll stop in and see if I can help with anything. Yeah. And uh, they were down in American Fork at the time, and I sat down with the CEO, and he says, well, Tim, I, I, I have to tell you that um, not all the board members know this yet, but I'm leaving in three weeks, and they're going to wow. need a CEO. So, um, you know, I saw the prospects of the company. I met uh -huh. the team members. I think we had, you know, five or six people in management at the time. Yeah. And um, I said, you know, why spend the time during the year trying to find the perfect fit when here's a company that's ready to go, has got a good team, has got a business in, in the marketplace, mm -hmm and um, that I think we could do something with. Uh, so I joined in January. Okay. Um, we raised a, uh, a round of capital right after that in March, uh, 1.4 million for us, um, awesome. which has given us the opportunity to do some pretty amazing things already. Yeah. Um, we've grown our core business over the last uh, nine months or so, but more interestingly, we're building some new technology that's gonna revolutionize that part of the marketplace. Really cool. Um, and for people that don't know what a chargeback is, if you've ever, called your credit card company and disputed a charge, you created a charge back. And that charge goes back to the merchant <clears throat> and they lose the money for the sale that they made to you. And what we do as a company is we fight on behalf of the merchant to recover those money, those funds back for the merchant. Tim is your enemy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't always go back to you. I mean, against you, a lot of times the issuers will just take the loss. Oh, okay. um, but they'll take the, the consumer's word for it. Mm -hmm. that I didn't make that charge, great, we'll take it off your bill and then they charge it back to the merchant, and then it's a fight between the merchant and the issuer to see who ends up taking the loss. Sure, so um, a pretty cool opportunity that you're exploiting there. Um, I mean, when you were looking at chargeback, I mean, you had so many different hats on at that point, being you know invested already, um, you know, looking for an opportunity, and so what, was it more the team or the idea or the combination of the two? Uh, what stood out to you that made it work in such a great fit? Yeah, I, I think it was a combination of the two. One, that it was an existing company. Uh -huh. um, the companies I worked in before were startups that we started from scratch. Yeah. And if any of you have been through the fundraising process, it takes a long time. Sure. And I wasn't eager to go through another year of fundraising for uh -huh. the next startup and not knowing what's gonna happen. So here was a company that was already up and running, and that was a big advantage in my mind. Um, and then two, looking at the business itself. You mm -hmm. know, that particular piece of the market, while it's not a big part of the credit card business, it's big in absolute numbers. Yeah. Um, the numbers are like $3 billion a year that merchants lose to chargebacks. And the solutions that are available to merchants are pretty rudimentary. Yeah. Um, it's kind of shocking. When The more we dug into it, the more opportunity we saw to build technology that would make it completely different um, experience for the merchants. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we're, we're coming along with that, and we're pretty close to being able to roll that product out. So that's exciting. Um, you know, I just love the challenge. Uh, you know, I love to work with a team, especially a group of people that um, have been there, they've got the domain knowledge, and they're just really looking for that direction. You yeah. know, and if we can work together to set a vision and create a company that's worth a lot, mm -hmm. that's pretty exciting. That is exciting. So um, you say you like the challenge. Are you finding, so my, my bank just sent me a, a new credit card that's got the little chip sensor that I know the rest of the world has had for years, but right. here in America we're you know, taking our sweet time. Um, 
is, is are you finding that that new technology is going to challenge the model at chargeback at all? Not really. I think the uh, the you know the volume of chargebacks will just shift. Right. Um, the more electronic commerce there is, there's the more chargebacks in that area anyway. Okay. Um, so the experience in other in the European countries is that um, in person fraud goes down, but online fraud goes up. Okay. And we expect the same thing here. Now, um, that's really cool. With uh, with your particular product being so focused on credit cards, is there plans in the future to you know branch out into other areas in the financial area? You know, th there are other areas that I would call sort of exception processing in financial services, mm -hmm. which is what I would consider chargebacks that we've talked about. For example, a lot of companies get uh, complaints from the Better Business Bureau, yep. and you have to respond to them in a specific way. And if you do a good job at doing that, you get an A from them. It's not whether you're right or wrong, it's whether you've responded and answered all the questions. So that's another market opportunity for us. Um, probably over the next 12 months for us, it's probably dead focused in the chargeback space. Sure. Because as we build out this technology that will allow merchants to respond more effectively to chargebacks, that's going to flood the issuers with all these chargeback responses. So we want to be there to, to build technology to help them respond to those documents. And ultimately, we want to hold, uh, own the whole pipeline, you know, from dispute all the way through to resolution. Okay. So th what, what are you finding that your challenges are today? Is it easy to find talent in the valley? Um, are you, you know, wh where is it that chargeback struggles? And you know what are you guys doing to overcome that? We don't struggle at all. That, that's great. To hear. <laughs> and, and startups aren't risky. Yeah, they're not risky either. Um, you know, I would say the biggest thing is just day-to-day -day priorities. You yeah. know, things come up, and it's easy to get pulled in one direction or, or another. And it's really important to have kind of a clear vision of where you're going, mm -hmm. be able to make um, incremental decisions along the way to accommodate things that come up in the business, but keep moving towards that ultimate goal. Um, you know, capital burns, you burn through capital if you're not making money, right. and that's your time window to be successful. Um, and you have to accomplish a couple things. Either you have to get profitable, mm -hmm. or you have to create enough value in the company to attract other investors into the company. Um, so I think about it as there's a couple of milestones that uh, will be big for us. One is um, we're improving the efficiency of our own operations mm -hmm. with the new technology, which that's kind of a given. We're getting that result already. Um, we're trying to scale the core business of what we have, and then we want to roll out the new product to at least one client. Mm -hmm. and once we have it in the market and we have a proof of concept, then I think it'll be a lot easier to go out and talk to people about raising funds. So doing that before the cash runs out is the challenge. Awesome. And I think we're on a good tra trajectory to accomplish that. Okay, now how has Utah been compared to other places that you've worked? Um, it's been great. One, it's a beautiful state. I'm, you know, finding myself pulling over and taking pictures of sunsets all the time. And then I bore these guys with them. Look, another beautiful sunset. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we see it every day in half or 30 years. Um, but so I like Utah. I like the environment. I like the people that I'm working with. And mm -hmm. from a fundraising standpoint, it was a really interesting experience because some of the investors that um, came into this round are, you know, they're part of like Park City Angel Network or, or um, some firms that are very active in this valley. And they're really easy to work with compared to my experience on the, on the West Coast. Um, you know, I'm, I met one guy, had an hour-long conversation, and called him back the next day, and we had a $100,000 investment from him. And it was like, I like it here. It's so much easier <laughs> in California in the BC, formal VC process. But, you know, every, every company um, needs to think about what kind of VC they're looking for. Mm -hmm. It depends on where you are in your life cycle. We were kind of like a restart of a startup. Um, sure. So we were kind of like an early stage seed round that we just did. And um, so the kinds of investors we, we brought in were people that like to invest at that stage. So you said that things are different here for the VCs. Can you expand on that a little more as far as like, uh, you know, particular what are they doing that makes the experience different? Um, well, one is we get to a, a complete team meeting much quicker here. Okay. Um, that's been my experience. You know, it's only a, a data set of four mm -hmm. examples. But when I go to a meeting here, on one meeting, I thought I was meeting with you know a junior guy and a couple of his teammates, yeah. and there were 14 people in the room. Wow. I was like, this is it. You know, this is a decision-making team. Mm -hmm. Now, it was we were too early for them, so they didn't invest. But I really appreciated that I didn't go through cycle after cycle with yeah. them. It was, you know, tell us your story. We'll let you know if we're interested. And if we're not, this is about the time frame that you should be coming back to us. Um, so that's, that's one example. Um, and then two, the investors I have in the company are extremely supportive. They're mm -hmm. easy to get a hold of. They're not overwhelmed by too many things going on at once. Um, cool. So as a, as a CEO, I can contact any of my investors 
pretty much the same day and ask them questions or get feedback on different things that come up, which is very helpful. I wish I could say that about me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so the, give us some advice for anyone who's involved with a startup that's preparing to do the fundraising process. What's, yeah. what's the most important? Give this, you know, pretend like, you know, you are the going to give them the outline of here's what's to focus on in the top part. Right. Right, so I'll, I'll start with a little bit of, of background. So I've raised money three times. Uh, the first company, um, I was only involved in the very early stage investment rounds. The second company account now, I uh, was the CEO and raised $22 million in three rounds of capital raising. And then at, uh, at uh, Chargeback, we've just had one round since I've been there. But I think the most important thing is to, number one, um, target the right potential investors for your company. Um, if they're, especially in California, there's a lot of people that'll be happy to talk to you mm -hmm. and you go in thinking this might be an investor and then you find out at the end of the meeting that they're not interested in that segment of the market at all okay. or it's too early of a stage. How so, do you find out? Um, most of them will tell you what they do, right? So you can go to their website, find out what stage of company sure. they invest yeah. in, what, um, you know, what uh, market segments are they in. Um, at least know those things before you go in. And I, I th a third thing that's really important, I think, is knowing what stage they are in their round, in their, mm -hmm. their fund. Because if they're later stage in their fund, they're not going to invest in you because that right. fund is winding down. You're going to have to wait till they're, the best time is when they're early in their, they've just closed their round or they're in the process of closing their round. They're targeting companies just like yours, you know, seed stage or series A mm -hmm. and in the area that you're in. Um, they probably won't invest if um, they have a competitive company in your space. So sure. I think those are probably a waste of time. Um, now, when you, you, you know, went through the process and actually got the money, uh, which is a, a position I've not been in, you've raised money and I just spend money. <laughs> and so how do you prioritize what your next move is? Yeah, so... Um, you know, when I, the first startup I was in, we raised, I think the first round, the first part of the round was like $600,000. And the CEO said to us at that time, he said, don't think of it as 600,000. Think of it as 600, $1,000 increments because every decision you make is going to be a thousand dollar decision. And I think you got to look at your capital that way is really okay. be conservative with it early on, only spend it on exactly what's necessary mm -hmm. to spend it on and only make the hires when you really need them. Uh, because that you'll burn through it a lot quicker than you think and it'll take a lot longer to raise money in the future than you think. Don't wait till you're two months from, from uh, 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 the end point. You, know, you need to be out there three, four months before you're going to run out of cash. Cool. So do you have an entrepreneurial hero or someone that you look to as like a real example of someone that you're patting yourself out Yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't say a specific individual, but I really respect the entrepreneurs that built businesses out of markets that didn't exist before they, okay. they got to them. LifeLock's an example. Um, you know, the whole idea of monitoring your credit bureau, mm -hmm. you know, didn't exist like 10 years ago and Experian really bought a company that was doing that and now Credit Karma's come up yeah. and they've made it free and they're using the information for marketing purposes that pays their bills. Um, so it's really companies like that, you know, okay. that create something out of a market that never existed before um, that I, I really respect. You know, they saw an opportunity. They not only had to build a business to, um, to support that market, but they had to convince people that there was a reason they needed to know that information. You know, the whole thing about um, uh, knowing your credit score. You know, mm -hmm. personally, it's not that important to know it on a day-to-day -day basis, but some people really think it is. Yeah. And it's because of all the advertising that these guys have done to convince people how important it is that you know exactly what your credit score is. Right. So um, let's, let's back up and let's go, you know, pre-college and, and back to your roots. What, where did you grow up and... Um, you know, share, share with me a little bit of that background. Sure. Um, so I was born in San Francisco, uh -huh. and uh, both my, my parents were not business people. My dad was an educator. Okay. Um, but at a young age, we moved to Palm Springs, and Palm Springs was a small town. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was good growing up there, um, and I, I think that's kind of where I think about my first entrepreneurial experiences um, happening for me. I remember, um, uh, you know, asking my dad that I wanted a TV in my room, and he said, if you get half the money, I'll pay the other half. I was like, okay, that's a deal. I'll figure out how to get that $30. Yeah. I think it was $60 for a black and white 13-inch rabbit ear TV back then, which is probably before your time. Right. I mean. <laughs> By a long way. Um, but it, it kind of sparked it in me that, you know, if you want to achieve in life, you can do it. You just have uh -huh. to set your mind to it. Um, you know, uh, 
after uh, growing up there, I wanted to get away from the small town, and I uh -huh. moved to Irvine, where I went to college, um, undergraduate at UCI, and then on to a business degree at UCI. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, I, I always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to be in a startup, but I didn't do that right away, yeah. uh, which is, I think it's been a big advantage for me, because um, I had a lot of business experience before I got into a startup. Um, I don't think it's required, but I think it definitely helped. Um, so after graduate school, um, you know, I really wanted to be in a bigger city mm -hmm. than Irvine, so I moved up to the Bay Area and have been there since. Really cool. Um, so talk to us about partners. Have you ever had to work with a partner? How do you select them? Um, you mean like third-party partners or partners in so like, uh, working like direct, like if, you know, picking a CTO or right. you know someone who's going to be on your day to day. Yeah, yeah. So that's important. Obviously, those early hires are everything in a company. Um, you know, you, you can make a mistake and it can ruin the company from with your first hire. Um, you got to make sure that you have an, a vision that's aligned with one another, mm -hmm. and you even have a working style that works well together. Um, because it's a culture that you create early on that perpetuates through the life of the company. Mm -hmm. um, Account Now was the last startup company that I, I started, and you know what I see, I saw develop there was that over time we had a group of people that knew what to expect from one another, and they had expectations about how they should work together and what they should expect in terms of performance from other people. It made my job a lot easier. Mm -hmm. I remember one time we hired somebody from a, a big company, and she just didn't have the startup mentality. And it wasn't long before it was like very clear that okay. she should move on. And I didn't do anything. You know, it was really yeah. kind of the team saying she's not the right fit. So setting that culture up right at the beginning, you know, basing it on um, integrity and honesty, and you know, making decisions based on information, not just mm -hmm. emotion. Uh, you know, I think is really important so that you have a, a framework to look at problems with together. You know, when you look at a problem, it's like, well, what does the data tell us? Okay. And then let that lead us to the conclusions rather than, you know, it's my opinion versus this other guy's opinion. Then um, when you're finding yourself, or can you share an experience where uh, you've had, like, the, you know, maybe one or two, like, pinnacle challenges of your career and what you did to overcome them? Sure. Um, you know, just think of one that I, I'm particularly proud of. We were um, a credit card company, and mm -hmm. the first company was called NextCard, which was an online credit card company, and one okay. of the first banks online. And we were trying to get big co-branded deals, and Amazon was on our radar to mm -hmm. do a, a co-branded uh, credit card with us. And we had a few deals, like we had a Dilbert card and a few other small things. And Amazon was just kind of hanging back and hanging back, and one day they said, well, let's get you guys down to meet the people in operations. And they came down to meet us. And after spending an afternoon with us and talking with us and giving, convincing them or, or giving them the, the uh, confidence that we knew what we were doing, it changed everything. Yeah. You know, like within a few weeks, we had to deal with them. So I think it's really important, especially with partners, um, to have face-to-face -face meetings, mm -hmm. um, share as much as you can about you know, what your area of expertise is, and let them see that um, you want to work with them in a real partnership kind of fashion. Um, I think that's probably one of the, the biggest uh, uh, accomplishments, I would say. Okay. Um, can you share uh, specifically what you look for when you're hiring? Yeah, I mean, it starts with smart and motivated. Uh -huh. you know, um, obviously, certain areas, you have to have the skills. You know, technology is one of those. Yeah, yeah. You have to have those skills. But you can also find out that somebody that's got a lot of finance background could be a great person in operations. Um, and we've seen that in, in our company at Chargeback. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm much more about the person, you know, than the okay. specific skill set. Um, it helps if they have the domain uh, knowledge. But if they're smart, they're going to learn it fairly quick. I mean, okay. financial services is a rocket science. So uh, it's pretty uh, easy to, I wouldn't say easy, but yeah, I was gonna it's, say. it's attainable. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And then, so do you, when you're uh, going through, like, a new product, uh, when you're trying to go through that ideation phase, um, do you bring everyone in? to that meeting or do you just like have a specific people who are sort of your creatives that you're pulling from? No, I, I probably start with a smaller group. Okay. And I try to, and I've done this a few times and I think this is what works, is when you have a big vision of a system or a product, it's much broader than people can imagine when you first explain it to them. Mm -hmm. So the best way to do it is start with a, you know, kind of a, a description of what you're trying to do and get them involved in thinking through what it can become. Okay. And then over time, you know, it really kind of takes on a life of its own. You know, we're doing that right now at chargeback.com. Uh -huh. We talked about this product that would allow merchants to work their own chargebacks, and I haven't dug into the detail, but I'm certain that there's way more functionality in that thing 
than we ever talked about with me. You know, sure. the team has come up with that. You know, because they can see what will work better. Um, I, I I would say this um, without a doubt. You have to communicate and communicate and communicate mm -hmm. um, that vision of what you're trying to create, like constantly for months. And then over time, it just becomes part of the expectation of the company that um, this is what we're doing. Okay. And you've got people. You've got to assign the resources to it as well. You know, you've got to make sure somebody's accountable and responsible for each component of it. Okay. And are there any like specific pitfalls that you're finding with the financial uh, industry that you know, as a, if I were a startup going into that direction, that would be really good to know about. Well, you know, I would say financial services is green fields for uh -huh. startups. Um, there was a big conference just uh, last week in Las Vegas called Money 2020. And, um, you know, I went to that conference a couple of years ago and there were 1,500 people there. This okay. week, last week, there were 7,000 people wow. there. And it's, you know, 700 CEOs. There's all the big companies and there's a lot of little companies that are doing things that are going to facilitate business for the big companies. Mm -hmm. um, and the good thing is that the big companies know they're not going to invent everything. So they're yeah. happy to work with startups. Um, it's kind of it's kind of a perfect storm for creation of, of okay. companies in that space right now. But there's also a lot of failures in that space. I mean, if you think about wallets, like if you went online and said, "Show me all the companies offering wallets," uh -huh. you'd probably find a hundred of them, and eighty of them are gone. And um, so the thing about financial services, um, the the rocket ship success is pretty infrequent. Right. Um, in the last twenty five years that I've been in financial services. I can only think of a couple examples mm -hmm. that really succeeded and many examples that failed. Um, you know, deposit, uh, remote capture of a deposit check yeah. was adopted very quickly, yep. um, but nothing else has been. Back in 99, I was talking to one of the guys at um, NextCard about chip cards because he was from England. He said, uh -huh. oh, you guys will have that in five years. And I bet him we wouldn't. You know, now it's 2014 and we still do <laughs> That's a good bet. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. So I want to... Uh, ask you a couple more questions, and we want to get uh, some questions from our audience as well. And so, just be prepared for that. What What is really next for Chargeback? What's the you know the next domain? Yeah, um, you know we're laser focused on that core product that we're working on now. Um, you know, and I think that's what makes companies successful is being mm -hmm. really focused on what's your primary mission. Um, the first step is getting the technology rolled out internally, so we're using it ourselves and we're, we're getting the benefit. Um, you know, a few months ago we were maybe 20% gross margin on the, the product we do internally. We're over 50 now, and when we roll this out I think we'll be over 80 or 90. So we're going we're gonna to prove it internally ourselves. And then the next thing is getting it rolled out to merchants. And we have a couple of large prospects we're talking to. Uh -huh. um, and you know, once it's once I have those data points in place, you know, those proof points of our, our strategy, yeah. then the plan is to either raise money or maybe we don't need it, depending on you know how those relationships go. Okay. Um, and then really expand the business. I want to capture the, the entire market of uh, chargeback processing. Awesome. So now, are you, do you find a real significant difference between the internal development you do, the internal facing, versus what's you know, con consumer facing? Is there a big process difference at all for chargeback? I, you know, I, I think for us, the external is not going to be going to consumers so much as to merchants. So okay. it's, it's not going to be as whiz-bang as yeah, yeah. You know, what you need it to be just to attract a, mer a consumer to look at the site. But it still has to be intuitive and easy. Sure. Um, I think there's a lot of good examples out there that we can just model after. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people did that to my companies in the past. They go, oh, we like what you're doing. Now we're going to do it too. Yeah. I mean, it's like frustrating, but it's the way it is on the internet. Mm -hmm. So we'll do the same thing. You know, we'll look at, um, you know, we'll make, the, I've used it internally. I say, you know, let's make the chargeback, TurboTax of chargebacks. Sure. You know, make it that easy to help a merchant make it through the process mm -hmm. because it's a real pain point for them. Um, the internal development is a, is a little different too, right? There's more specialized functions that we have to build in there, and that's really where the domain expertise comes into play. Okay. And the guys that are doing the job every day, you know, know all the nuances that we have to pay attention to. Okay. And the technology guys are very close with them. You know, we, we work in a nearly open environment. We have some offices, but everyone's uh -huh. in one physical location, which I think for a startup is essential. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to... Turn it over to you guys. We have some questions. Do we have any questions from our audience? I'll bring you to the mic. Hi, right, thank you for coming out. Sure. Uh, once you're once you're ready to take financing from investors, how do you reach out to them? Which channels do you go to? Uh, is there anything you say? Is a business plan important? At what stage does a business plan become important? Yeah, um, I, I think um, it's best if you can get an, an introduction from somebody. 
And that's pretty easy to do. You know, if you just are talking to one investor, say, who else do you think would be interested in this? They'll rattle off some names for you and then ask them for the introduction. You know, can you just do an e-intro for me? And that just opens the door. But even without that, most VCs are pretty easy to get a hold of. You know, their websites show you how to submit information to them to uh, get meetings with them. Um, you know, my personal view is a business plan is not that important. Gavin is over here and he's one of our investors and I know he might disagree, but I've done three startups I've never written a full business plan because I don't think the VCs look at them. I mean, they want to see a PowerPoint deck that's got all the important information and then they're going to ask you for more information as you go. So you don't have to have all the financials in the first deck. You can have some high level summary data and then they'll tell you what they want to see next. And that's been uh, what's worked for me. So you spent most of your career in the payment space. Was interested in knowing what macro trends you're seeing going on in payments right now, and where do you see payments 10, 15 years from now? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the big macro trend is things moving off of cash to you know other forms, electronic forms of, of payments. But we're still a long way away from that. I think just recently, maybe a year ago, we went from from 50% check and cash to more than 50% debit or credit card transactions. So I think that will continue to grow. Um, I think most of the big payment companies still view checks and cash as their, as their market that they're trying to cannibalize. There was a lot of talk at the conference about um, you know, electronic payments like uh, Apple Pay and whether that's going to really move the needle or not. You know, we really have one use case that has had great success in the market, and that's the Starbucks electronic payment. It's the only one. Um, so I, you know, I think it'll catch on over time, but I'm not sure that paying with a phone is any easier than pulling out my credit card and swiping it. Um, so financial services is a little tricky because I just don't think, thing, think that things change that fast, but it's good to kind of keep your feelers out there and see what's, what's going on. Um, there was a lot of talk about Bitcoin, but I haven't paid much attention to that. So Utah's not generally known for financial services, startups, or any industry actually, I don't think. I think Boston and New York are, those tend to be uh, where those companies start. Do you see yourself staying in Utah and, uh, or opening an office over there or right. what's, what's, where's your location in the future? Right. You know, I, what I've learned is that Utah is becoming a hub for startups. Um, you know, it doesn't have as, as well developed ecosystem for startups as other places like Boston, New York, or San Francisco, but there are some good people here. Good investors, uh, I think talented folks that have the skill set you need to build a startup company. And I think if you, I, I think it's as good as any place else. Probably, I think I, uh, I would say after San Francisco, I would put this, uh, the Utah area right up there. Um, and just from my personal experience working with the investors, I've really enjoyed it. You know, they're all about the business. You know, they're not about the politics of, who's investing in what deal next, and how do I get in on that hot deal down the street in Silicon Valley, they're about the companies that they're invested in. And they're extremely helpful um, to us, they have been so far. Any other questions? Yeah. Just, can, can you give an idea of uh, scale and speed of growth? So like how, how many people and how big did the account now get over what period of time? And you see the ability to replicate that here? Yeah, so I, I think they're absolutely the ability to hire the people that we would need to grow this company. I think with the new products that we're rolling out, we won't be people intensive. You know, we will have different kinds of jobs in the company. So, you know, the folks that are doing chargebacks today might become chargeback support specialists in the future, you know, helping merchants. Um, so I, I think the company can grow here organically, no problem. Um, there's another part to your question. Like, uh, just an example from before, how fast is Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, one thing that I would say that this is important for any startup is to really watch how fast you're growing. You know, the first startup I was in grew too fast, and I, I can tell you a long story about that, which I won't, but it was the downfall of the company, because the more people we added, the less got done. So I think it's important to have a focused, small team that works on the product, especially at the beginning. Um, you know, Account Now, you know, grew from two of us to 12 of us in a year, and maybe another 12 the next year, and then maybe in the third or fourth year, we're at a couple hundred. So it's that the first couple of years, you know, managed growth is really important. Make sure that everybody's contributing to what the business objective is. Back here. So uh, I like how you said that it was your experience where you um, started working for a while before you went into a startup, before 
they started yeah. in, that, in that direction. <laughs> at what point? At what point did you have the confidence, and how did you decide that you were ready to go to a startup? Yeah, it was more opportunistic. Um, you know, I was in working for G Capital in Ohio, and the internet was happening. You know, it's like this is going to change everything, and I got to be a part of it. And I happened to connect with a guy that had come from a company I worked at before who was starting a bank on the internet, and he needed somebody with operations experience. So the skills that I needed, that I had, were a good fit for what he was trying to do. Um, so it was more, I don't think there's a, a clear defining uh, line, um, especially now, because I think there's a lot more ways that you can get the resources you need than there used to be. I mean, it used to be you had to find the person with those exact skills. Now there's tons of companies that specialize in all these different areas. You can find a company to help you with operations management. You can find Zenny's here, and they can help you with their technology. So there's a lot of different resources you can draw on. Um, so I wouldn't be afraid if I felt like I, I lacked a certain skill set, because there's a lot of places you can go to get those. Okay. Thank you. Guys, let's give a big round of applause to